So in this segment of Managing Your Anger by Anderson and Miller, uh, this one is called Being Salt and Light. The Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 3 to 11, are an encouragement to the humble minority who live in the world that lies in the power of the evil one, 1 John 5, 19. There are injustices everywhere. Blessed are the poor in spirit because they are afraid of their need of forgiveness and a new life in Christ. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn because of the sinfulness of humanity, because Jesus came to bind up the brokenhearted, set captives free, and to comfort all who mourn. Isaiah 61, 2. Blessed are the meek who have great strength under great control. They don't respond in the flesh. They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be satisfied with the fruit of the Spirit. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. They give others what they need and not what they deserve. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God and his handiwork when others are not even aware of his presence. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall become be called the sons of God. Believers and non-believers alike recognize their good works and calming influence on society and, aware, and award Nobel Peace Prize prizes to people like Mother Teresa. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the righteousness for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Their unwavering stand on moral issues is doing kingdom work. They will be reviled, persecuted, falsely accused, but their reward is great in heaven. Such people are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Matthew five, thirteen to fourteen. God works through them, us, to restrain the evil forces that corrupt the world, being motivated by righteousness or by righteous indignation to overcome evil with good is how we function as salt and light of this world. How can we restore saltiness to the salt, verse 13, and put our lights on a stand, verse 14? First, we have to look in the mirror. Judgment begins in the household of God. That is where Jesus started when he cleansed the temple. John the Baptist confronted Herod, a Jewish leader, not Pontius Pilate, a surrogate of secular Rome. The atrocities of the Crusades are still considered a blight on the church history. The Reformation was essential for correcting church practices, but thousands were slaughtered afterwards by carnal Christians. Arpathida was supported by the Reformed Church in South Africa. The Orthodox Church stood silently by while Stalin and Lenin ravaged the people of Russia. Catholics were part of the liberation theology that plagued South Africa and also covered up the sins of child molesting priests around the world. Southern Protestants supported slavery before the Civil War, and many churches were still practicing racial discrimination a century later. We can't preach the good news and be the bad news. We have to take a the log out of our own eye before we notice the speck that is in our brother's eye, Matthew 7, thir- uh, verse 3. It is hypocritical to speak out against social ills while our own sins are being exposed. Judge not, Jesus said, that you will not be judged, Matthew 7, 1. Second, turn to God in prayer the moment your anger is aroused by the injustices around you. I was playing golf with three Christian friends right across the street from the Columbine High School in Colorado when 12 students and a teacher were killed by two rebellious students. Ironically, we saw it on TV in the clubhouse after nine holes. We stood on the 10th green, held hands, and prayed. There is no effective way of channeling righteous anger than having a prayer vigil during the following senseless tragedies. Paul wrote, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. That is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 1-4 Rather than be rebellious to governing authorities, we are to pray for them that they would be instruments for justice and those who need justice would come to a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Calgary, Canada, a group of pastors 
took this seriously. City officials have a huge responsibility and often feel the heat from the public. Police, paramedics, firefighters are in constant danger. So two representative pastors made an appointment with the mayor who was not a believer. He probably had his guard up when they came. He was surprised when they asked for a list of all their police and fire personnel so their church members could pray for them, their safety, and their families. The mayor immediately told his assistants to give them what they wanted. The pastors went to council members and asked how they could pray for them and their families individually. One female member was a self-proclaiming liberal and told them so. A year later, her voting took a decisive turn when she became a believer. Jesus said, But I say to you who hear, Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. Luke six twenty seven to twenty eight. That is humanly possible impossible when you are filled with righteous indignation. Because of their unrighteous behavior toward you, it is not impossible for God, however, because his love is not dependent upon the, the object. He loves us because God is love. It is his nature to love us and love others, which is why it is unconditional. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. In order to love your enemy, you need to be filled with God's Holy Spirit. Then you may be able to act kindly to those who hate you, bless, you, uh, bless speak well of those who curse you, and pray for those who abuse you like Jesus did on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke twenty three thirty four. Spirit-filled believers don't let their enemies determine who they are uh, or succumb to their provocation by responding in a carnal way. That is the Holy Spirit-enabled love and self-control. Third, be a silent witness. God is omnip- uh, omnipresent, and he will convict the world concerning sin and righteous judgment. John 16.8 We don't have to do that. If your children are misbehaving, you don't have to say anything when you walk in their room. They are caught and conviction is written all over their faces. Let yourself be known as a Christian where you live, work, and play without being obnoxious. Sinners loved to be around Jesus and he was most upset with religious hypocrisy. If you are glorifying God in your body, then God's presence is being manifested wherever you are. Some may not choose to work or play with you because your presence is too convicting. You may also be attacked for your godly life. 1 Peter 4.4 4. When the cat's away, the mice will play, but the hidden effect of just being present is also affecting the spiritual realm. Discerning Christians can meet another believer for the first time and sense a compatible spirit. Like spirits attract, opposing spirits repel. I have approached people who are under Satan's influence, and they depart without saying anything. The demonic spirit harassing them is reacting to the Holy Spirit within me. I have seen people who are seeking freedom push their chairs away from me and recoil when touched. When we train encouragers to use the steps to freedom in Christ, We instruct them not to touch someone in a spiritual bondage until they are free. Then they have a compatible spirit and want to be hugged. Don't overlook the value of the church's physical and spiritual presence in this world. Wherever and whenever the church is strong, there has been an elevation of social justice and decline when the church is absent or acting carnal. 4. Use assertive anger to stand up for righteousness when directed by God. The only thing that has to happen in order for sin to abound is for good people to do nothing. There are two major questions that need to be asked before the action is initiated. Do we have the right and the ability to make a difference, and who is ultimately responsible? And we will finish this section uh, tomorrow.